Bethesda's losing the narrative. What used to be in days gone, lovably poking fun at bugs, has just turned into disappointment, frustration, anger, and now, most dangerously, apathy. What's happened is that Shattered Space, the DLC for Starfield, is out, but it is not what many people hoped for. What it is, is a cosmic horror DLC set on a single planet with a far smaller scope that's essentially trying to meet one set of criticisms, having handcrafted quests and set pieces, but not doing much at all to change the big picture. It's a traditional Bethesda DLC grafted onto a game that only serves to highlight their weaknesses by sabotaging their strengths. It is no Phantom Liberty, and it was never going to be. And between interviews and data, we can piece together why and work out what's next. Now that Shattered Space is out and scores have settled, we can assess its reception. On OpenCritic, the average is 57%, and in Steam, it's currently 30%, but those scores are not the same. OpenCritic is just an average of critic scores, whereas Steam is just a I recommend or do not recommend, a little bit more similar to Rotten Tomatoes. Now, what's great about OpenCritic is they also carry recommendations, and for Starfield Shattered Space, only 28% of critics recommend it, which is pretty much in line with the Steam score of 30%. That's brutal, and Bethesda DLCs have been hit or miss. As an example, critics liked Automatron and Nuka World, but didn't necessarily recommend them. Wasteland Workshop was panned, but Far Harbor was pretty much well liked by everybody. And comparing it to Shattered Space, it's clear that Shattered Space was really trying to be Far Harbor, to be high quality, handcrafted, story driven, all of those things that you want from a role playing game. And looking at Shattered Space, it is clear that passion has went into it. The new area is real cool, but if you don't like Starfield, it will do absolutely nothing to change that. And it's clear that people are not seeing $30 of value. Let's assess that because that's where things really begin to make sense. $30 is, of course, multiple indie games or three quarters of a mythic weapon skin in Overwatch, something that just shows today's insane market with pricing. But there's a point that's clear throughout all of it. This $30 could be multiple indies or a full AAA game that's on a discount. But of course, the thing is, price and value are different things. Price is an objective amount of currency you've got to hand over for something. Value, well, that's in the eye of the beholder, it is subjective. Far Harbor was well received, costing $24.99, and it now sells for $15. It also launched just six months after Fallout 4, and adjusted for US inflation, that $24.99 is actually around $32 today. But to put a twist in things, without Googling, I want you to think of a number. How much did Shivering Isles cost in 2007 when it released one year after the launch of Oblivion? Let me know what that number is down below, and now I'll give you the answer. 2400 Microsoft points. That's $29.99. And if you adjust that to inflation, that's 45 of today's dollars. Hell, Oblivion cost 60 bucks in 2006 and inflation adjusted, that's 92 of today's dollars, which feels completely insane, but it makes the point. Price is just what we pay value is what we perceive. And all of this makes it clear that compared to the past, Shattered Space is objectively not a price shocker. It is priced in line with the rest. What it is, though, is a value shocker, because the perception of its value is rooted in our perception of Starfield's value. And unlike the much-loved Phantom Liberty, Shattered Space does little to nothing for this game's foundations. And that is why Fallout and Elder Scrolls fans are a little bit scared here. Bethesda seems to be in decline. It feels like they've lost their magic. They have had multiple misses. And with headlines like this one from PC Gamer that says, Bethesda Haunt Show says Starfield is the best game we ever made in a massive bout of amnesia, it sure seems that's a common feeling. But as always, diving into that quote, seeing what an ex-dev has said and a few other things, do reveal a more interesting story. And it's that extra layer of perspective and context that really is what we do here. And to make that sustainable into the future, we've launched Ballular.Games. Over there, we publish loading screen to our members daily. We sift through all of the news, we bring it together, put it in context, and we keep you in the loop with that daily newsletter, all free from advertisements and algorithms. Like as an example, this recent loading screen episode that's covering Alien Isolation 2, because yes, that's happening, and the rather massive hit that Tim Sweeney was able to land on Google. Plus, over there, you help out our mission, you get videos ad-free, you get our research reports, you join our community, you can hang out with us over in the Discord, and uh, basically, it means that we can properly build something with you here to last. Okay, let's talk about why Bethesda are not changing Starfield. 
The PC Gamer headline totally evokes our feelings on loading screens, lifeless proc gen planets, wooden writing, weak world building, and how Shattered Space fundamentally doesn't do much to fix the basic situation. And that all contrasts with Phantom Liberty, a DLC that came along with a massive update that was on top of loads of other updates that basically completely rehabilitated what Cyberpunk 2077 was. Now, there's things that explain this. First, the quote that PC Gamer put in their headline is taken a little bit out of context. Second, though, it's that Bethesda does not think that Starfield needs fixing in the same way that Phantom Liberty tried to fix Cyberpunk. And to you and me, that may seem completely insane, but I'll break it down. You see, Cyberpunk 2077 was, as a piece of software, literally broken on last-gen consoles, and even before launch, everyone from management down knew. So it was broken not just in design ways, but also as a piece of software. Now, Starfield is a game that I bounced off, you probably bounced off it, didn't enjoy it, but it did function as a piece of software in a way that Cyberpunk often did not. As much as, yes, Cyberpunk had glimmers of a vastly superior game within it. Comments, though, from ex-developers give us insight, right? So, Starfield is a standard Bethesda game with standard Bethesda technology, but as a design document, it doesn't really fit the standard Bethesda game design format and the tech that they were able to build it with. It's very different from the past. It's discontiguous. And according to Just Perky Games, who worked in Fallout 3, Skyrim, 76, and Starfield, who has since quit and went indie, they grew from around 65 to 115 people during Fallout 3 and Skyrim to 500 by Starfield. He didn't like that. He didn't like making games in that environment, so he quit, and he's went indie. And according to him, Starfield was made across four studios with a massive team, of course, including the outsourcing as well. And that is what makes it all make sense to me. Bethesda's games have always had their bugs, their jank, their wooden dialogue, and their weak main stories. What sold Bethesda games was that way you could get lost in a handcrafted world. That would happen in the other games. The problem is Starfield was scoped as a design beyond their technical safe spot and in a way that was disjointed. That means that it highlighted their weaknesses and smothered their strengths. When everything's chained together via space and fast travel, you don't get the natural journeying from one location to another in a contiguous world that allows you to just stumble upon things. No, with Starfield, the software is very obvious. It feels so much like a game and so little like a world. You have that, and then you have all of the weaknesses that come with a large team. Because the larger your team goes, the more diluted your talent pool is, and the harder it is to hit a consistently high quality bar. And in fact, this September, Todd Howard called the games they make, quote, irresponsibly large. Well, Todd, I've got to say for Starfield, I absolutely agree. But that's not all that Todd said. And we also have got some player data to inform us just how these games are played and why Bethesda are making the decisions they're making. Over on PC, the Starfield player count's rough. I mean, right now, after the DLC, it's hovering around 6,000 concurrents. Um, at the same time, literally the same time, Skyrim Special Edition had 14k concurrents. It's probably a little higher right now if you're watching this during peak hours, but that's basically the picture. And through 2024, Skyrim's monthly averages were 18 to 20k. Starfields were 5 to 9k. What we see is that while the Starfield numbers are low, they are surprisingly stable. And through that stability, we do see that for some people, the formula actually does work but that compared to the rest of Bethesda's output, it is still rather niche. I mean, removing the television show related spikes, Fallout 4 hovers around 15K and 76 performs similar to Starfield. So Starfield is a sticky game. It's just far more niche. And I think what really highlights that is that Shattered Space launched to around a 20K peak, but then within a week, it just returned to baseline. And that tells us another slice of Bethesda pie is not doing much to help. Now, there is a 2023 Muzu analysis that makes console look a bit more healthy. And just this June, Todd Howard said that the average playtime is over 40 hours and that they've had 14 million players in Starfield. That may seem completely crazy, and they've certainly not had 14 million sales. But just think about name recognition. That is going to get them a lot of sales. And of course, Game Pass. Because yes, while PlayStation has utterly dominated this console generation, Game Pass has a remarkably high attachment rate on consoles. Starfield was the big name, and for so many people, to count as a player, all they would have to do is download it, boot it up, and play it. And as for the 40-hour playtime, 
that makes sense to me. Just look at the Steam chart. It's not a big chart, but it is pretty long. You know, sometimes in YouTube, you might have a video that will not perform that well. It might have a low click-through rate. It may get a low number of views, but it could have an amazing watch time. Turns out that there are people who really like that video, but it just doesn't appeal to that many people. And because it doesn't appeal to that many people, the people who stick around will watch or play longer. That makes sense to me. And what makes Bethesda's line of reasoning more clear is taking a look at the interview that spawned PC Gamer's headline, because it clues us in on at least externally how they're framing this. Starfield is developing its own unique fan base. It's big and it's growing. Bethesda used to feel like the studio of Elder Scrolls. Then it was the studio you'd associate with Elder Scrolls and Fallout. Now it's Elder Scrolls, Fallout and Starfield. Bethesda Game Studios, big three. Now, to many of us, we read that and think, what the hell? But my understanding is kind of simple. There is going to be no Phantom Liberty, no version two, no thing that fundamentally changes the story here. They think they can just take the snowball they've got and continue to roll it down the hill. Going by the rest of his interview, at least their public framing is that that worked really well with Fallout 76. And I have heard loads of accounts of people who kind of love Fallout 76. It's just niche compared to what I would say it could have been had it not launched the way it did and not had the design problems that it had. And so personally, I understand what he's saying. I actually get Bethesda's decision making, but I think there is a fundamental problem. They see some good numbers. They see some encouraging numbers. Having an average playtime of 40 hours in your game is goddamn incredible. But here's the problem with following numbers. The numbers that you have can make you blind to the numbers that could have been had the circumstances been different. I worry the numbers and trends like that risk making us feel confident but not see the big picture, that they essentially give us an excuse not to be more ambitious, not to properly tackle the problem, and perhaps to not see the forest for the trees, not see that ambitious changes, truly transformational ones, could change the narrative of the game. But that being said, there is one thing that should be in their favor with Starfield going forward, and that's that it no longer has a full production swell of developers. That is a good thing, because if any team is to turn a game like Starfield around, it'll be a smaller team and a more agile team that is not held back by the management of such bulk asset creation as the full production of a new game demands. So their plan to continue as 76 did sure does beat leaving people high and dry. And as much as I do struggle to see a version of Starfield that I would enjoy, what worries me, and what I think worries most of us, is what comes next, and what Bethesda have learnt from what is now years and years and years of, uh, well, just strangeness, and for many people, disappointment. We first have to understand structure. Todd Howard is the executive producer of all of their games, and in June, he said they have 450 staff across five teams, those teams being Starfield, Elder Scrolls 76 Mobile, and then external and partner development. Of course, Elder Scrolls 6 was kicked off by a core team, and from what we understand, a different core team to that of Starfield. But obviously, whenever Starfield went into full production, hundreds more staff joined that project. And whenever the same happens for Elder Scrolls 6, we can expect similar, hundreds more people. And that's where I want you to again consider the structure of the game. Map out Starfield in terms of play spaces and player actions. What you'll see is thousands of tiny little bubbles, all linked together by various forms of travel that just feel like a piece of software loading something. There's one word that completely captures the problem, and it is this discontiguous. That's what Starfield is. Now, I want you to map out an Elder Scrolls game. Do that, and rather than all of those tiny little bubbles in various different places scattered across different planets and systems and waypoints, what you find is a map. One that you can litter with points of interest where there will be clear natural space between them. So instead of going from New Atlantis to some other city and that involving a bunch of loading screens and going through little bubbles of space and all of that weirdness, no, you just go out the door, you have one loading screen, it takes you into the overworld, and you walk down a road to get to the next city. And all of that space in between can naturally be filled in with detail and character and love. That fundamentally seems like something that fits a larger team, way more so than the disjointed, confusing, muddled structure of Starfield that, frankly, their technology was barely able to handle. And so I expect Elder Scrolls VI to still be a Bethesda game in every way. If it is structured like an Elder Scrolls game, I think they will have a fighting chance. But 
if it takes on a Starfield's level of fundamental design risk that exposes Bethesda's limitations, then we will be in trouble. But even though it has a fighting chance, I worry that Bethesda hasn't exactly got with the times. I think they're still capable of making an amazing world that you want to get lost in with beautiful music, lots of immersion, and all of that good stuff. But through all their recent projects, dialogue is wooden, stories are hit and miss, they are below par. Many Morrowind diehards felt that Oblivion was a decline from what they loved. As an Oblivion fan, I felt that Skyrim was a decline from what I loved. Its quests didn't hit as hard as Oblivion's, just compare the Dark Brotherhoods. It doesn't compare. And so I want to be excited for Elder Scrolls 6, but to me, the lack of improvement on the core RPG foundations means that I'm not. Skyrim revealed cracks, Fallout 4 forced me to reassess, and since then, things have not looked up and they've not inspired confidence. That's where I'm left on this one. And what ties all this together is how we perceive value, how we assign price to that and what we're willing to pay for things. And that is a game that Sony are trying to play. They're trying to play it in a way that Nintendo have actually been successful in doing. And if you'd like to learn more, check out this video next.